Good morning to the South Hills Church family, and welcome to those of you who may be visiting our YouTube channel. My name is Matt Harbour. My family and I are newish members at the South Hills Church, and we are excited to work and worship with you all. Today is January 9th, and we were scheduled today to begin our new adult class Bible study entitled Honest Worship, a study of the book of Psalms. Obviously, not everything has gone exactly according to plan this morning, as we have had to pivot to this online format due to concerns over the coronavirus. So instead of doing a full pre-recorded class today, I thought I would just do a teaser for the class, which we will attempt to resume next Sunday, the January 16th. So in brief, for the next few minutes, I just want to answer the question, why study the Psalms? And maybe a good way to begin answering that question is to consider our church's circumstances this morning. We've had to cancel our Bible study period and our worship period due to health concerns related to the coronavirus pandemic, which has now been a concern in our country and the world for nearly two years. Some of our own members are currently infected with the virus and quarantined today, and we are obviously very concerned about them and are praying for them and for their quick recovery. And this pandemic has also brought with it a host of other concerns for our society, suffering, illness, death, economic hardship, uh, political strife, isolation and loneliness, anger, impatience, mental health crises, and so on. Despite our trust in God, Christians are not immune to such challenges. And such challenges can produce questions and anxiety, even in believers who are filled with faith. Why is God allowing these things to happen? When will God deliver me from these struggles? I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, it can be uncomfortable for a Christian to voice honest feelings like those when God feels far away. And unfortunately, it can also be easy for Christians who aren't struggling as much to look down on a Christian who voices their disappointment with God. Well, in times like these, the book of Psalms becomes a great spiritual resource for us. The Psalms teach us, first of all, that experiencing doubt and disorientation is normal. And second, the Psalms teach us that honesty with God is always the best policy. Consider the last few verses of Psalm 88, for example. But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. Obviously, the psalmist here is going through something terrible, uh, something that produced feelings of loneliness and anxiety and fear. And the psalmist brings those feelings with brutal honesty before God. One author who writes about the Psalms says, the Psalms speak about human experience in an honest, freeing way. This is in contrast to much human speech and conduct, which is in fact a cover-up. The speech of the Psalms is abrasive revolutionary, and dangerous. It announces that our common experience is not one of well-being and equilibrium, but a churning, disruptive experience of dislocation and relocation. Most of the Psalms can only be appropriately prayed by people who are living at the edge of their lives, 
for most of us, entry into the Psalms requires a real change of pace. In other words, the Psalms are raw and they are honest and they address honest feelings toward God. And that can be a real change of pace for those of us who are uncomfortable bearing our souls in that way. But exactly for that reason, they're also a great spiritual help. You may remember from the book of Romans, the apostle says, apostle Paul says, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. And this next statement that Paul makes is so interesting. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Your translation might say, we don't know how to pray as we ought. But what's the solution to that? What is the solution when our words come up short as Christians? He says, the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And this passage from the Apostle Paul reminds me of something that Jesus' disciples asked him in the Gospel of Luke. And you probably remember this as well in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples, teach us to pray. So both this passage and the passage in Romans suggest there are times that we as God's people don't know what to say to God, that our feelings and our experiences are overwhelming and words can fail us in those moments. There was a German Christian uh, named Dietrich Bonhoeffer during World War II, who was actually uh, martyred by the Nazis mere weeks before the end of World War II. And before he died, uh, he wrote these words about prayer and about the Psalms. He's reflecting on what the disciples said in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, Lord, teach us to pray. If they're asking Jesus how to pray, that must mean, Bonhoeffer says, so we must learn to pray. In other words, prayer doesn't always come naturally. We must be taught how to pray. The child learns to speak because his father speaks to him. He learns the speech of his father. So we learn to speak to God because God has spoken to us and speaks to us. By means of the speech of the father in heaven, his children learn to speak with him. Repeating God's own words after him, we begin to pray to him. We ought to speak to God and he wants to hear us, not in the false and confused speech of our heart, but in the clear and pure speech which God has given or spoken to us in Jesus Christ. And Bonhoeffer goes on to say, thus, if the Bible also contains a prayer book, and he, he's talking about the Psalms, we learn from this that not only that word which he has to say to us belongs to the word of God, but also that word which he wants to hear from us. Because, Bonhoeffer says, it, that is the prayers of the Bible, especially the Psalms, is the word of his beloved son. This is pure grace that God tells us how we can speak with him and have fellowship with him. We can do it by praying in the name of Jesus Christ. In response to the request of the disciples, Jesus gave them the Lord's Prayer and all the prayers of Holy Scripture, including the Psalms, are summarized in the Lord's prayer. So in other words, we have to be taught how to pray. Our hearts don't always lead us to the right words as the apostle Paul reminded us. And in such moments, the Psalms can teach us how to pray. They can give us the right words, which are not only the words that David and other ancient Israelites spoke to God, but they're also the words that God has given back to us to pray as Jesus himself prayed. Because remember that Jesus himself, in his darkest moments, in his darkest hours, including the moment of his death, when he needed to speak to his father, he chose the words of the Psalms. Remember in Matthew chapter 27, as Jesus hangs on the cross, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And Jesus wasn't making up those words. Jesus was drawing upon the words of David all those centuries before. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? David took that honest, or Jesus took that honest speech of David and made it his own. And so we too can do the same thing through the words of the Psalms, knowing that we pray them not by ourselves, but also with our Lord Jesus. Similarly, the Gospel of Luke records that as Jesus is about to die, he calls out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And again, those were not just Jesus' own words. Those are the words of the psalmist in Psalm 31. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. So once again, Jesus takes up the speech of the Psalms into his own speech and prays them with us and for us. So in conclusion, the Psalms are, first of all, human words to God. These were words that ancient people like David um, in Israel prayed to the Lord. But that's not all the Psalms are. The Psalms are also then God's words to humanity, because they have been preserved and recorded by the Holy Spirit as scripture, as the Bible, as the word of God. And so human words to God become God's words to us for our edification and encouragement. And then we in turn make these words of the Psalms human words to God again, as we can pray these words through Jesus who prays them with us and for us. So the Psalms are really a wonderful thing in that they preserve this conversation with God, these honest words of worship and prayer. So as we close out, I just want to offer a couple more quotes about the Psalms to help hopefully uh, get us excited about um, studying through and reading through these Psalms together. Most Christians for most centuries, says Eugene Peterson, uh, have taken the Psalms as their basic prayer text and prayed them finding in such praying an immersion in the entire range of the human condition and the incredibly varied ways in which God meets us. If you think there's a feeling, an emotion that you have that no one else has ever had, the Psalms teach us that that's really not true, that there is a common human condition that the Psalms can help us discover um, and grow from. Uh, similarly, another author says, suffering is a major theme, perhaps the major theme of the Psalms. The book of Psalms has always been held precious by the church, not only for its hymns of praise, bless the Lord, O my soul, praise the Lord, you heavens adore him. Those are great thoughts, but that's not the only thing in the Psalms. Also because of its laments and prayers for help which show how deeply the faithful struggle in both life and in faith. So let's struggle through uh, the Psalms together. Uh, let's uh, let these words of the, the ancient Israelites uh, be an encouragement to us because we recognize that these are also God's words to us. And they're also words that our Lord Jesus prays with us and for us. So, um, we are, aren't at the building today, obviously, but um, in the church lobby, there is a reading chart for the Psalms that hopefully can allow us all to read the Psalms together on the same schedule. It roughly comes out to about three Psalms a day. Um, there's been a week of that already um, in which I asked people to read the first Psalms and the last Psalms, but if you're just getting on board today, that's great because we're starting back at Psalm 1 tomorrow. Uh, January 10th. And I have these readings scheduled only for Monday through Friday, so you can use the weekends to catch up. And again, we'll go at about three psalms per day um, together. Um, this chart is also in an email from January 3rd uh, from the South Hills email account entitled Psalms Class Welcome. You can find that the PDF attached to that email. There's also going to be a study guidebook. Um, there are still limited hard copies available at the building. The next time we're able to be together at the building, um, uh, these have already been purchased by the church. We have a suggested donation of five to ten dollars if you want a copy. If we run out, you can also find this book on Amazon, Christian Book, any other online website. Um, and we do have a reading 
for next Sunday, the 16th. Um, that's the introductory chapter. It's called Invitation to the Psalms, pages 11 through 15. These are short readings, very helpful, down to earth, easy to understand language that helps orient us to, to the Psalms. And finally, um, on the other side of the Psalms reading chart um, in the church lobby, there is a syllabus for the class. So if you want to look ahead and know what we're going to be talking about um, and get an idea of what readings we'll be doing, uh, you can pick that up. This is also available as an attachment in that email from January 3rd. So if you have any questions about any of this, please feel free to email Scott or me or um, anyone else um, that you may know who could um, point you in the right direction. But this is our plan uh, for the course, uh, for, the, for the class over the next uh, three, two and a half months or so. So I hope this will be an encouraging study and I look forward to seeing you all in person as soon as possible. Let's continue to pray for one another for health, for uh, both physical health and spiritual health. And let's uh, hope that this class can be uh, something that can uh, bind us together and also glorify God. Thank you all for your attention and Lord willing, I will see you next week.